Welcome to the Artist Palette. I'm Joan Fabian, also known as Joan of Art. I'm in the studio today with Steve Dallaluce. And he doesn't call himself a painter, though he works a lot in painting. Uh, I'm in a studio and surrounded by some works. And we're going to talk about some things about your work. Uh, where do you get your inspiration in your paintings? <sighs> well, I'm very interested in the sublime. I like that whole notion. Mm -hmm. um, some of it uh, based on what Edmund Burke has to say about it anyway. And uh, to a lesser degree, Kant. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this whole idea of a, a transcendental kind of state, something that is transcendent, uh, beyond the ordinary. Right. Um, I like the idea of well, what are you Vast reading right spaces. now? Spaces. Are you reading something? Uh, you know, music. You. We were talking before the cameras were rolling that you like to listen to music. I do. And diverse music, not just one type. So that's an influence, isn't it? It is to some degree. To some degree, it is. Uh, I know I like to get lost in it while I'm painting, mm -hmm. and I prefer music that um, has no words or no lyrics that I can understand anyway right, while right. I'm painting because yeah. uh, yeah. that can sometimes kind of influence you and I prefer to just get lost in the work. Okay. You know, you can turn some music on, uh, maybe it's in another language. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very ethereal. Right. And maybe I'm working on a piece that's uh, an imagined landscape, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, another So you have an active experience. imagination. Yeah, and it, it allows me to sort of get lost in the piece and, uh, so what you I can't love, really plan out your paintings from well, I do. step by step? Well, I do plan it out, I, I, for, uh, an initial springboard. Okay. I may have an idea in my mind. If, if you wish, I can give you an example of, yeah, sure. uh, of, of how that happens sometimes. Okay. I, I tell younger artists, too, you, you can get your inspiration from anywhere. Mm -hmm. It might be something someone says to you, something you've read in a book, mm -hmm. something you've seen on TV or in the movies something that occurred to you while you were uh, out walking, uh, a, something in a piece of music or a poem you've read. It can come, from, it can come yeah. from absolutely anywhere. Well, I'd like to tell you a story of one piece just to Go. Yeah, it, sure. it, amplify that a little. Okay. Uh, once I was uh, sitting in a, in a couch at home and watching a TV program, and it was a science program, mm -hmm. and they were talking about uh, Einstein and his theory of relativity and they, somehow or another, somewhere in there, they, they began to talk about how uh, energy moving at the speed of light can coalesce to become matter and all this kind of stuff. And I was in one of those twilight states where you're caught between sleep and dreaming and mm -hmm. I'm nodding mm -hmm. like this and, and I began to dream as, as the words were reaching me from the TV set and I imagined myself careening through space at the speed of light, wearing a t-shirt and jeans. And <laughs> Just what yeah, you had on. And what I had on, careening through space. And I began to worry, what happens if I reach the end of this? Am I, is there an end? Will I be destroyed? Will I, will I go on an endless circle? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what will become of me, which mm -hmm. was sort of a ludicrous thought, but right. it's what I was but thinking. You, you, you can't explain your happen? dreams. I allowed it to happen. Yeah. Sure enough, I reach the end of the universe and I puncture this membrane and this begins to slow my body down. And as I'm slowing down, my body is turning slowly. And as I turn, I see this incredible sight. It's like a vast human ovary looking thing and it's open and all this incredible light from gases and trillions of galaxies or or what I'm seeing, I think. Wow, you have an active and, imagination. And, and I suddenly realize, oh my God, that's the whole universe. So where am I? You know, and yeah, then I, it, yeah. it dawned on me that the, that the universe yeah. is, is contained within this other dimension, another universe. And, and about that time I woke up and I realized, oh man, I have to paint that. So it became an inspiration for a particular piece that I did called Ovum. 
two. And it didn't come close, really, to capturing what I imagined, but it was the general idea. So, so I had a springboard to work from with that idea. I kind of sketched it out and played in Photoshop a little bit and painted something there to get me started. And I began to work on the piece. And then you go with the piece as you're painting it. You let it mm -hmm. take you somewhere. And um, it, one of those things where I'm sure you've experienced it, you're standing in front of your work and you're working on this piece and it seems like 15 minutes have gone by and you realize it's been four hours. Right. Yeah, because and you're so into it. Yeah. Well, Body that, and soul, everything. That one piece led to an entire series of works, mm -hmm. about 20 some odd paintings mm -hmm. that spawned from that one inspiration, right. if you will. Right. Um, but, but I think what happens is the way those other things happen is in the act of working. You know, while you're working well, on a piece. One thing leads to the next. It does. It does. I've made art as far back as I can remember, mm -hmm. someone once asked me about that. When did you start? And I would have to say, can't even remember crayons on the walls, of <laughs> my poor me mother's too. kitchen, and things yes, like that. Yeah. And I just never stopped. The need so was always it there. It was always there. Always never there. really questioned it. You know, right. you just think it's something everyone right. does. Right. I never really questioned. It. I thought everyone did that. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I went to SAC uh, for a semester, and then that whole military episode became this great interruption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then before you know it, you're raising a family, all these other things. Right. Life happens. Life happens. But the whole time I was in, mm -hmm. I always found a way to create art. There's... Well, I'm very interested in light, uh, eth ethereal kind mm -hmm. of light, mystery, uh, imagined spaces, mm -hmm. that kind of thing, something that goes maybe a little outside of the ordinary, but I'm still grounded mm -hmm. with the figure as well. It's something that, for whatever reason, uh, has always remained. I have right. an attraction to it, and I think it's because we're human. And human beings identify with that. I mean, because with we are- With each other, or yeah, with the because landscape? We are, well, we're human beings. Now, the landscapes are really, they're not real places, but they could be. They're up in they're your up head. They're up in here. And so, so that is conceptual. They're right there. there. Th there's but there. it's a different one that's not, put in a textbook yeah. as this. I never classified them as landscapes. Right. Others have because Imagine I typically scapes. divide the space with a horizontal line. And the right. minute you do that, You've people got a think horizon. horizon. Line. Yeah. And so as soon as you do that, uh, the thought landscape comes up. So rather than fight it, I said, okay, they're imagined landscapes. When, when in reality, they really didn't start that way. They started as something more abstract. Mm -hmm. They started with the notion of being non-objective with it, but as soon as you put a line, it's objectified. Your brain wants to make sense of it, so it isn't just a division of space. Right. You now have right. a horizon. Yeah. And so yeah. Uh, I don't fight it. But going back to what I said, what we were talking about on beauty, mm -hmm. I reject that whole notion. I, 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 think, I think beauty is um, something that is, uh, it, it has the potential to elevate mm -hmm. uh, to me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that makes us human, I think, is the appreciation of it. Yeah, we... Now, I can't define what that is mm -hmm. completely because what one person connects to and thinks is beautiful, another may another not. Another person, yeah. But, but, that, but that, that word is not a dirty word to me. Okay. I have no problem with it. If there's something that... that you know, I, I, I'm attracted to conceptual works that, that stimulate me intellectually. You could appreciate them. I appreciate yeah. them. If, if they make me, if they pose questions for me, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm intellectually stimulated mm -hmm. by them, I enjoy that. Right. But it isn't the only thing I enjoy. I also enjoy works, and personally enjoy making works, that maybe have no intellectual stimulation whatsoever, They're or just very beautiful. little. Or, or they toy with the notion of the sublime. Right. And, and so th there are things that evoke a feeling are probably the works that attract me the most. Mm -hmm. Something that hits me in the vi viscerally, at mm -hmm. the gut level, mm -hmm. that uh, I, takes my breath away or makes me feel something, right. rather than question something intellectually about it. I just enjoy the presence of the piece and the way I feel when I look at it. I see. See. Okay. So, so I'm okay with that. Yeah. It doesn't have yeah. to explain anything. No. It doesn't have to answer any questions. Mm -hmm. It's okay to all, be able to do I, the nude figure and in landscape. In and of itself, if I enjoy it, I enjoy being mm -hmm. its, in its presence. And even if and somebody said, well, it's been good, done before. I don't care. Who cares? And, and, and not by me. Right. 
that piece I've but been you done have before. a viewpoint so I have my own viewpoint around it uh, look as long as there are human beings I mean we're all alive you know yeah okay a kid has been born before right. it's sort yeah. of a ludicrous yeah. comment to me yeah uh, it's been done before if you're making a conscious effort to copy something that's been right. done that's one thing right if on the other hand you're taking your own mm -hmm. uh, spin on something or trying to present something that's coming from inside of you or toying with some thought that you've had, you have no way of knowing whether someone else has had that thought before or not. Right. Uh, odds are they probably have in some way. Mm -hmm. And I imagine every flipping medium on earth has probably been used, so we can mm -hmm. argue it's been done before. Right, right. But we put our own unique spin on it. And, and it, you know, it hopefully. should be done before. I mean, like you said, we're human. Yeah. We're always going to be obsessed with our forms. The, the body and also our environment. Those are two main things. We live on this planet. Yeah, we live on this planet <laughs> and how we react to the landscape, how yeah. we react to uh, the human form yeah. is always going to be different, but yeah. it unifies us. Which is why on the one hand with these imagined landscapes, I get to escape that a little bit because I can create a world that's from my imagination. It bits exists and pieces. there, bits and pieces, but yes, they're obviously affected by life. Right. You know, we live on this planet, yeah. we experience yeah. uh, human interaction and things like that. Right. So those things are going to crop up because they're part of our memory, they're part of our, our, our brains, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. in there. Our imagination um, is, is active and alive, but I like to go somewhere else with paintings, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, these imagined pi right. pieces because they, they, they take you outside of yourself a little bit and maybe to some other place that could be, that, that isn't necessarily what you would see down the road. Right. Uh, as a young man, uh, as a young boy, I can remember being in the park with my father and we would stop and I would look at a sculpture of all things. And uh, because I'm not a sculptor, but right. I was attracted to these sculptures, and where bronzes. Was this? Bronzes. Oh, we've lived all over the world. Oh, we've okay. Lived, I, I so where was this in a, this example? That uh, you were in a park or? Oh, we might have been in Japan. Okay. Uh, I, I, we lived. I've lived 14 years in other countries because my father was in the oh, that's Air Force. Definitely a big influence. Yeah, a I huge think. influence, and so you, you get exposed to all these things. But I can recall seeing sculpture, mm -hmm. and they had these beautiful patinas on them. These 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 lovely greens and you know colors on the bronze. And uh, that stuck with me, and I always was attracted to that for some reason. So after I left school, UTSA, mm -hmm. uh, I, I began to explore, want to explore that whole idea of these patinas. And I wanted to find a way to incorporate those into my paintings, because I'm not a sculptor. Right. And uh, so in the process of experimenting in the studio for months, Mm -hmm. <laughs> different metal surfaces, right. applying different chemical concoctions to see what I get. And you didn't uh, blow up your studio. It's amazing. <laughs> and, and then I got this book that sculptors, that's really for sculptors, called yeah. The Colorization and Patination of Metals. An incredible book. I recommend it to anyone oh, who's okay. dealing with sculpture. And I was studying all these various metals and all kinds of chemical preparations that can be used to create these beautiful patinas. Well. I set it aside and decided to just experiment. And so I began to experiment. And while I was experimenting, I discovered other properties that were not like what was on the sculptures themselves. Mm -hmm. And what I was beginning to realize is that I could exploit these reflective properties of the light in the metal that I was playing with, different metal leaf, silver, copper, gold, mm -hmm. composition gold, mm -hmm. platinum, things like this, aluminum. And finally, one day, I discovered some things that seemed to grab me. You know, they, they interested me. So I created this painting using this copper leaf and gold, and I sprayed these chemicals on it that would give me little spatters of mm. greens and whites, depending on what I used. And uh, they just had these beautiful textural properties. Plus, I had this objective aspect to the material but a reflective property too and I wanted to exploit that mm -hmm. so I did this painting and I let it sit for a few days in the studio and I came to wipe off some dust that I saw on it with a rag and some of the paint slid right off it was a so mistake it was a mistake accident yeah it was an accident we talk about that so so I realized 
okay, back to the drawing board here. There's something that I need to do. And through more experimentation, I realized I needed to, it, it lied in the sealant. I needed to seal the, the resulting patinas I was getting, these crusty areas of the metal that were colorized. I needed to seal them, but I needed to seal them in such a way that I didn't destroy them and still give myself tooth for the oil paint to grab. So it's a right. technical yeah. problem. Yeah. And it just took a lot of time until I figured it out. And so uh, I would use uh, like a polyacrylic spray. I thought, well, I could use, since I haven't painted with oil yet, I could use an acrylic. But you were painting with acrylic at this no, point? No, I was painting with oil. Okay. But I could use the acrylic on the metal leaf because I haven't used oils yet. And I'm thinking that I, I had to experiment how many layers would be enough of this mm -hmm. and how fine. And I knew that little droplets were falling on the panel, so I was getting these little microscopic tooth that the paint could grab. Mm -hmm. At least I was thinking that this might happen. I held my breath when I did a piece and did that and it worked. And five years later, it was still looking great. So yes. I knew that, th that this okay. process was gonna be okay. Uh, I've since learned that there are other materials I could use too. So that you learned that process. I, I learned mean, the process just from lots of hours in the mm -hmm. studio working. Experiment. I, I can't overemphasize that just sweat and work ethic Working and hard work. And not every real, piece is going to be a masterpiece. You can't wait for inspiration. You yeah. get in your studio and you get your and butt you busy. Yeah, you work. Right, That's right. what you got to do. <laughs> exactly. And then, and then those other things, I think the inspiration will follow. Those things will be One spawned. thing leads to another. It does. I think that there's no substitute for time in front of the easel. Right. If I could say anything at all, I, right. I, I'm going to say that. Okay, that, that's, that, that's good. That's, a, that's I like one it. I hope folks will you hang on to. You do time in your studio. You got to do that. You know, sometimes you, you live in your studio. And that's where you make discoveries. Right. And you shouldn't be afraid to experiment with things. Now, mm -hmm. to this day, I think the work I'm known for is the work where I employ the metal leaf in my work and mm -hmm. a lot of light. A anything that we create, you know, if you make a painting or a drawing, whatever, you're really creating an illusion anyway, mm -hmm. I think, right. of something else. That, well, realism it, with painting or anything is yeah. an illusion. It's not actually that thing. Yeah, it's not that thing. I mean, that the painting is not yeah. a person. Yeah. It is a representation of the person. Right. And in the end, it's just paint on a surface. Right. Paint and other materials slapped exactly. on the surface. Exactly. So, uh, but that's a lot of fun. It is. That's a lot of fun. It is. You know, sometimes I think of it as a, a blessing and a curse. Mm-hmm. Because mm -hmm. you love to do it and you derive so much enjoyment from it. You know it's something you would do if you never made a dime at it. Right. You can't you help still it. Do it. Yeah. You can't not, it, right? Yeah. You have yeah. to do it. And it's an added plus if somebody likes it and and buys it, right? That's a bonus. That's a bonus. I consider that a bonus because I would do it anyway. Right. And um, so we need you, something to support your habit, right? And that's a good one. You when you're selling it, you know, you get the flow. Yeah, no kidding. That that it, it's a wonderful feeling. Um, there is a danger, though, that you can get so caught up in that if you start selling works and you start to realize other people are connecting in some way with your work to the extent that they'll sign their name to a check to buy it. Right. And this can can be a very uh, seductive thing. Sure. If and I do this, you, I get this. I get that. And then before you know it, you're, you can doing, be, that. You, you're doing that and you can get overwhelmed with work and then you're not... Then Being you, honest. Well, or, or your, your work can become more superficial and you're cranking out work, mm -hmm. almost your like factory. an assembly line yes. uh, to get it out, to meet deadlines and, and such. Good. And it's not good. Sometimes you just have to hold back and say that that money over there is nice, but I would be embarrassed to sign my name to this thing and put it right. out there. I, I need to to put more depth into this work and more right. thought into this work and really feel like I have something to say with it. Um, to me, the goal isn't making the money uh, the, the, at all. Mm -hmm. It isn't that at all. Although I've been I've been very fortunate to be successful at what mm -hmm. I'm doing now right at this point right. um, self-supporting with it and so it's I've been very fortunate mm -hmm. but like I said I would I would have done it whether I made a dime or not mm -hmm. um, I think for me the goal was always to make the best piece of art that I could possibly make within the limitations of whatever has been given to me and whatever things I have learned over the years uh, so that once you finish a work it's like that next one 
if you can carry it just that just that little bit farther right just that little bit better right uh, you know that elusive masterpiece that you'll know you'll never really create and if you did you wouldn't know it anyway right but you're you're attempting to do that to create this this piece that says everything you want to say and that has taken all the skills and things that you've acquired over the years and it's just ah, right, finally yeah. and I know that's never going to happen right I just know it inside yeah. myself yeah but that doesn't stop you from reaching right. for it then you may be happy with it and yeah. it leads to another painting if I had done a piece that I thought ah at last I've created a master piece now you could just throw your brushes away I could away. just throw the brushes away I'm done <laughs> It, and it, I think it that's work probably that what would happen. It doesn't work no. that way. No. So it's always, well, and I've never been 100% satisfied with any work. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You look at a piece and you go, Oh, there's problems here. I'm going to investigate I that in the next one. It. And right. Da, da, da. And you know, there's always something wrong right. in the piece. Right. There's always something not quite right that you could just do. If I had just an extra week, I could... But you have to let it go at some point. Right, yeah. And, and I'm sorry I'm so long-winded. No, that's okay, uh, that's okay. But um, um, I, my, I have a question about um, when do you know the painting's finished? What, what, is, what transpires? I don't know if you ever really know if it's done. You know, you just stop. You see it in the gallery and say, no, it's not finished, and uh, take it away. You, you stop. <laughs> you reach this point where it's time to give it, you, it's time to... Let it rest and Do you ever like let it turn go. it around and put it I away do. for a long time? I and absolutely then take it? do. I will sometimes, if I have that luxury. This is the problem when you've got galleries you're providing yeah, work you to. Can. You have an obligation to them to give them a certain amount of work in the course of a year. So you've got to make work. Right. But If uh, you want the money. But yeah, if it's a work I'm doing for me, which I would love, if I'm just doing work right. for myself, for yeah. my own pleasure, I kind of miss that. Yeah. Um, I will turn it around and just let it percolate, mm -hmm. let it simmer, work on something else, Right. come back to it, maybe months later, maybe six months or a year later, Yeah. and you might have that epiphany, that aha, I know right. what to do with this now. I, yeah, I, I see I, what I was going for. And I love it when that and sometimes happens. it's the opposite. I need to throw this out in the garbage dump now. And sometimes it might be something you've learned yeah. in your process with an, another work that you can now bring to the table and you know that that is the mm -hmm. answer to what it is you, mm -hmm. that's not quite right with mm -hmm. your piece. Sometimes you have to abandon a work and just give it its burial and let it die right. and yeah. leave it alone and work on it. I got a few of those in my studio right too, now. More than it's I care like, to I don't say. know what to do with these problem children. And sometimes that's the case. And you, you the, the good thing is, is you can hold on to those for your own learning. Mm -hmm. You can go back and pull something and go, oh, I remember this. And uh, mm -hmm. hopefully it helps you to see how far maybe you've come, hopefully, since you did that piece. Right. So th there's value in holding on to some of those old turkeys. Yeah, uh, yeah. That, that Do you think that happened out. with Leonardo da Vinci and the Mona Lisa? He was always carrying it around. I, I, just can't, I just can't imagine that it didn't. I'm yeah, sure it, it did. was like he wanted perfection. Uh, and it's just, a, it's a fantastic thing. This whole thing is a journey, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. just a, it's just an exciting journey. Cool. You know, I, I want to, I hope I'm, if I live into my 90s, I hope I do, yeah. but regardless, I hope I'm still slinging paint. Yeah, and, and the I slime, in my and, studio, and making light happen. I hope, that if I could choose how I would die, that would be it. Right. right. Working on some piece in the studio and just, okay, it's all done, plop, and there you go. Right. That would be a way to go, yeah, that would if be, I could choose. Unfortunately, yeah. we don't get to choose. No, we don't. That would be the way I would choose to yeah. go. Yeah. Because um, it's just it's just a passion. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm curious about we were talking earlier about uh, that painting with the tattoo is back to us with yeah. a halo. Yeah. Tell me that story about sure. you know. Sure. Well, I was thinking about um, how sometimes we get affected by. Uh, well, there are stereotypes out there that unfortunately we succumb to sometimes. And I think that's a sad thing, but it's a real thing. So I imagined um, um, an individual that you might meet, say, in a dark alley at night at one in the morning on a sidewalk, mm -hmm. and this person is approaching you. And maybe he's a character that... You, you know, don't want them to approach Yeah, you. he's got this wife beater shirt on, and he's covered with tattoos, and he's, you know, he's buff from working out in the gym or whatever right. he's doing. And you might have this gut 
instinct to want to cross the street as right. he's approaching. Instinct. That, but, that, but the reality may be that this person is a uh, kind individual who would give you the shirt off of his back. And um, I wanted to depict this kind of soul mm -hmm. as a saint, mm -hmm. as someone who really would be that way, despite the exterior clues and cues mm -hmm. that you get. Mm -hmm. So I chose to do this painting that I call West Side Saint of a real human being who was brought up on the west side of San Antonio, a tough neighborhood, uh, who is a construction worker today and has a family, a wife and a baby and all that. And, um, and to depict him minus those external trappings, the wife beater shirt, the mm -hmm. other things that we might associate with gang, let's the say. The tattoo. But the tattoos, I left on him. Mm -hmm. Because these are things he chose to say about himself. These are things that said something about his character, where he's from, There's things about his heritage, you know, maybe some Aztec imagery and mm -hmm. other things, his neighborhood mm -hmm. emblazoned on his chest, that mean something to him. So I chose to show him that way, but to strip him of other external trappings mm -hmm. and uh, kind of depict this sort of halo idea out there. I've done, I've done a painting called Becoming, this particular piece, I wanted to depict a woman in a transcendent state and depict what is going on inside of her mind, but to show it externally. So you have this woman who is levitated. She's floating off the ground because that's how she's feeling within herself. She's not really floating in the air, but in her mind she is. So she's floating off the ground and her body is becoming, the outer shell of her body is dissolving. And I wanted to show what she's really comprised of. And mm -hmm. it's this energy, this light, this inner being. And I'm trying to reveal that as this powerful, incredible light and energy, which is a source of her, her life force and expose that. Mm -hmm. And so I titled it Becoming as though she's transcending the corporeal. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's an ephemeral kind of ethereal side to this sort of thing. And I'm very much interested in that whole subject matter. It's something that is very attractive to me. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me why. I don't know why. Don't I don't know. even question yeah. it. I don't even care. Right. But it interests me. It interests so me. I'm going to paint that until I get bored with it. Okay. It's something that's very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. So when you say realist, I don't really consider myself a realist, even though I may objectively show... Well, what is reality, really? Well, truly, because it really, again, it, is... Well, if I see something and I think that's real, and you go, no, it's not. <laughs> well, it's it's just funny. a painting of mine. Yeah. <laughs> and what we call real is really what? Things that we can detect with our right. human senses. Or, or, or tactile or yeah, whatever. Which doesn't mean that there what aren't things that exist beyond our physical senses' ability to detect them. Right. So you're right. So, so those things that we can't even see with the naked eye, there are atoms and electrons zipping all around us even though we can't see them. They're, They're no reality. less real than you and I yeah. sitting here. Well, like sometimes I paint, I, I did a whole series on dancers, for example, like that piece over there. And if you like to paint the figure, to me it's a subject that's beautiful because dance is sort of the poetry of the body. Right, if you at will. least dig us. And yeah. I think so, absolutely. Yeah. So I relate to that. And so there is a kind of poetry going on with a figure that is involved in dance. And so there's a certain beauty to that, which I, as I've told you, I don't shy away from. Right. I don't reject it. You're I not embrace it. afraid of I embrace it. the beautiful. Yes. I, yeah. I em absolutely the, embrace the it. The beautiful and the sublime. I love that. I love both of those things very much. Yeah. And even though I may be rejected by the contemporary art world, right. as contemporary has come to Right. to be defined. But I've noticed uh, that more and more contemporary artists are starting to do uh, realism again. The, the human body, I, I think in, in the late 90s, they started focusing on the body, probably because of all the AIDS epidemic and artists were so. uh, using it as a vehicle. And, you know, by by putting something that marks your painting contemporary, like the tattoos. Sure. That's a different aspect that we didn't normally see, but now we're seeing more of it in realistic. Well, but, it places us in this time in history, doesn't it? I mean, it, mm -hmm. it, it speaks to, we're in the 21st century. I don't think I hardly know a young person 30 and younger who doesn't have right. a tattoo somewhere. Right. Uh, I'm waiting to meet one, but yeah. they're, they're rare. I, yeah, I, that's, I, 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 I was wondering that. My husband, 
husband was asking. And I so, wonder if she has a tattoo. So well, there's something about that that speaks to this time. Right. So uh, it does it does place it in this time mm -hmm. in history it, for yeah. sure. When you have certain certain cues, certain. So you made like your that. paintings contemporary by exposing the the tattoo. Yes. It's that I, identifier. Sure, and I and I don't do that consciously. No. It's just a it's just right. a fact. It's a reality yeah. of the time that we right. live in. So so I'm okay with that. Yeah. I mean, uh, if they had an earring and a and a bowl fine. of fruit or whatever, <laughs> it would be kind of <laughs> conflicting. Now, was it the Renaissance that they wear earrings? I don't know. Maybe if they were pirates. I think that you mentioned that some folks are starting to look at the figure and things uh, like that, which I think is true. And I think that what can happen is you can take conceptualism to mm -hmm. a point where it becomes vapid mm -hmm. uh, especially it can run its course almost mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not saying that it has at all I they think will always be uh, there. they will always be yeah. there so I'm okay with that Just fads. but I'm also saying though but but uh, uh, unfortunately uh, beauty or figuration has been so utterly trashed absolutely maligned particularly in uh, academia I mm -hmm. think Mm -hmm. I really, I, I'm just, I, I have no fear to say that. I have no ax to grind. Right. Now, I know I get sort of um, dismissed or rejected in the contemporary art world. Mm -hmm. I made a decision a long time ago. You can't really bend yourself to do things that aren't you. I think that an artist needs to create what it is that they're passionate mm -hmm. about. Those mm -hmm. things that, that mean something to them or that connect with them, or that they feel. And I think if you're being honest with yourself and true, that's what you should do. Whatever that is, whatever that is that you were passionate about, you must do that. If it's, if it's large expanses of color that are very abstract and non-objective, then that's what you should do. do. It. That's what you should do. But we don't need to trash each other's form of art right. in the process right. or exclude one over the other. I think this is yeah. a mistake. I think there's room for it all. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. We can all appreciate I each other. I may not other. ever get a show, let's say, in the Blue Star Contemporary right. Art Center, right. ever. I think uh, because you will. Because of perceptions I, I of what I do. I have a feeling you will. But, but uh, what I wanted to say is I'm okay with that. Yeah, it's I've all chosen right. a different There'll trajectory. There'll be somebody else that will appreciate you more. Perhaps. But th there are different trajectories. Right. This, this whole term you art world, I think, is a misnomer. It is. It really it is. is. There are many avenues. There are many trajectories an artist it's can take. It's very complicated. And I'm saying this because I want to encourage other younger artists that just because someone says this is it and if you don't right. do that, you're dead. Exactly. Don't believe it. There are many ways you can go, and ultimately you have to be true to you. Mm -hmm. It's got to be in here. You right. have to connect what it is that you're making mm -hmm. and not be ashamed of it and don't right. be afraid of it, even if others are trashing yeah. it and dismissing you. Cool. Well, Just I'm gonna, don't worry about it. I'm going to end it now with that. Uh, thank you for joining us in, in Steve's studio, and hope to see you again in another episode of The Artist Palace.